We have two um, guests tonight. The first guest is Owen Jones. He hasn't said anything yet. Lower your expectations, yes. seriously. Owen was born in Sheffield and is slightly over 30 years of age. Uh, he has described himself as coming from a family of fourth generation socialists. So he's had a part of that labor tradition for quite a long time. He studied history at University College. One of his former colleagues is here today, a member of the Cobber Society. And it's the college also that G.D.H. Cole was at who wrote the first sensible biography of Cobbett in the 1930s. On graduation, he worked in the trade union movement as a lobbyist and became the parliamentary researcher for John McDonnell. He is now an author, commentator, and political activist with a democratic socialist perspective. This means that he has generally been on the leftist side of the Labour Party. He now writes mainly for The Guardian and The New Statesman and is to be seen quite regularly on political and current affairs shows on TV, and he told me before he has been once to Farnham when he was on Any Questions a few years ago. He has two main books out. One is called Chavs of the Demonization of the Working Class, and the other is called The Establishment and How They Get Away With It. This has chapters on, among other things, the police, the media, and the financial sector. It's available in paperback, in all good bookshops, and it's a very good read. So, Owen, you are very welcome. Thank you. Great to be here. Come on Now, we are expecting another guest, but he appears to be late. Where is Mr. Cobbett? A fine turn of events this is. Will Cobbett late? Will Cobbett lost? Summoned to a meeting at eight o'clock in the old maltings? I remember this place when I was a boy. This was a, a tannery. So, what sort of malt house has it become? And where's my meeting? Gentlemen, <laughs> and ladies too, I am happy to see. What a pleasure it is, although not entirely a surprise, to see you gathered in such numbers to listen to my opinions. <laughs> you see before you a cobbard, inexplicably late. Punctuality was always my aim. I even warned young men against having to endure the inconveniences attendant upon tardy movements. To be sure, you are uh, entitled to some explanation for my late arrival. Uh, the fact is that although my current um, place of residence is but a short step from this spot, my journey here was filled with more delights than I have ever seen together in my life, uh, in my former life. When I found myself at liberty in the churchyard that I know so well, I looked up at the church tower and saw it changed top by four elegant pinnacles that were not there before. A fine sight. Church lane, pretty as ever in the evening light, and coming towards me, a group of young folk, uh, young boys, or what I took for boys, laughing and full of fun. And as they passed me by, without seeming to notice me, I saw that they were not boys, but girls. Oh, were very pretty girls too, as all Farnham girls were to my younger eyes but all trousered like boys, not a skirt nor a petticoat between them. And not a horse to be seen, mind you, at least not for another hundred or so paces. And then, lo, I turned the corner and saw what I took for a horse and its rider. But no, it was, or it is, a statue. And you know my opinions of statues of the great and the so-called good. But this one, <laughs> it was of <a> me, <laughs> off on one of my, one of my rural rides. Uh, quite taken aback, I, I made out the, the wording attached to the base of it. William Cobbett, 1763 to, uh, oh dear, 1835. Oh, well, it's a fine statue, a very fine statue. And as I stood admiring it, I needed but to turn my head a little to see a short distance across the river my old family home and the window, top left, into the bedroom where I was born. <laughs> the jolly farmer, my father's ale and farmhouse. 
And what do you think, eh? What do you think they've been and gone and done? Why, it is now labelled, bold as you like, the William Cobbett. Now, that gave me quite a turn, I can tell you. And as I, as I temporarily lost my famous self-control and my, my self-composure, and as I looked at it, I remembered suddenly that I was summoned to address a meeting. <laughs> a farm, as I thought. But you being no farmers. Mr. Cobbett. You're welcome. Thank you, sir. May I introduce you to another journalist who would like to share the evening with you? This is Mr. Owen Jones. Hi. By the way, a, a, a journalist, I a journalist, eh? I don't remember you sending anything to my register. <laughs> Who'd you write for? Um, a similar newspaper, actually. It's the well, no, it's not the Guardian, isn't it? I've never been upstaged by a man who's been dead for 150 years. This is <laughs> humiliating, by the way. Um, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, the, the, the Manchester Guardian, it would have been about the time, I think. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but not that loathsome, poisonous times, I hope. <laughs> no, no, no. My tuppenny trash reached 70,000, did you know that? I didn't know I didn't. That's a yeah. fair whack, isn't it? Yeah. There's a lot uh, of people. Mr Cobbett, would you like to return to your seat? <clears throat> we, have, we want, Mr Cobbett, this evening to hear you <laughs> tell us about some of the issues that you raised in your political register and in your writings, issues, for example, around the poor laws. And you wrote, uh, you wrote a great deal about the poor laws and poverty in your political poverty, register. Poverty, poverty. And, and at one stage, you were referred to as the poor man's friend. Uh, poverty. I must have written more about poverty than any man alive. Or dead. Uh, I uh, managed to save a few scraps from my register. Um, if I can find it here somewhere. Uh, yes, yes, here it is. Uh, something I wrote in my register six months after Trafalgar. I wrote, we must too remember the state of the poor. Upwards of six millions a year are now raised upon the parishes to be dealt out in aid of those means by which the laborer obtains his bread. And of persons receiving this aid, there are upwards of one million. All, all the laborers having families are now paupers. This is a new state of things which has been produced by the funding and the taxing system, pushed to an extreme. Let us not be answered by the observations that there must be poor, that there always have been and there always will be in every state of the country, in every society in the world. We know that there must be poor. We know that there must be some very poor. We know that some must be maintained, or at least assisted, either by the parish or by voluntary arms. But is there anyone who will deny that this is a new and most deplorable state of things, which has rendered all the labourers having families paupers? Yep. Come on. Elsewhere. Elsewhere, I wrote of the terrible consequences of poverty. And I would be interested in my young friend's views on a couple of things I wrote. To be poor and independent is very nearly an impossibility. And what, in his age, does he say to a thought that still troubles me greatly? Poverty leads to the most evil consequences. Want, horrid want, is the great parent of crime. Well, thank you very mm. much, Mr. Cobbett. I think that Mr. Jones might well have some comments on that. Well, firstly, wow, what an honour to be back in the People's Republic of Farnham. Thank you. <laughs> uh, last time when I came, actually, um, it wasn't the 19th century. It was, uh, it was for, uh, as you say, any questions. And I was worried at the time that I was going to turn up and be... Uh, hung, drawn and quartered as a raging lefty. But in, in the end, the audience were a bit too left-wing almost. I had to kind of calm them down. So you obviously have a bit of a, a, a radical tradition here, which, of course, Mr Cobbett over there um, exemplifies. And you are looking very well, by the way, for a man of your age. You have the same youthful curse and blessing 
Uh, I do. Uh, I look about 12, but you, <laughs> but you, you, you do not look, you do not look 250 years old. Is what I'm trying to say. So well done on that. Uh, but this is a great honour, by the way. And thank you for uh, hugely for the invite. It's a unique format. I haven't. I don't normally speak to dead people, uh, <laughs> although some of the people I've argued uh, with. Uh, <laughs> it's been touch and go. Um, but uh, but the, his eloquence, I think. I mean, what's disturbing, by the way? I'm going to talk about poverty, but. Uh, it's frightening when you hear somebody from the 19th century uh, on the issue of poverty who is more enlightened than many of the people uh, today writing on poverty uh, in much of the mainstream media. So you are a depressing indictment, uh, Mr Cobbett, of, of our modern media uh, where you have more humanity and understanding of social problems uh, from somebody long dead than we do written in our own newspaper, not mentioning... Uh, any names in the Daily Mail. Now, what I was going to say, so we're going to talk about poverty, talk about poverty. Now, poverty, what I find interesting is because when you talk about poverty, you'll often get, for example, look at the conditions of Britons in the time of the 19th century when the likes of uh, William Cobbett were around and look at the huge increase and improvement in people's standard of living. And I'll often talk about poverty on air against right-wing pundits who are far less enlightened uh, than the dead man over... He's not literally dead, so I shouldn't just start this house macabre. Um, and, and they will say, what about people in Ethiopia? That's genuine poverty. It's insulting to poverty to talk about people in this country as such. And, you know, that's a dangerous line, uh, a dangerous route to, to head down when uh, poverty has to mean starvation uh, to qualify. Uh, of course, in the 19th century, you can say, you think it's bad now. What about the 14th century when... People were, being, uh, were dying en masse because of the Black Death. Uh, so I think what we do is we look, we judge a society, which is now, I was going to say, the fifth richest economy on Earth, but since Theresa May's speech, we've actually fallen to the sixth <laughs> richest economy on Earth. And we judge our country on, by that standard. How is wealth and power, how is it distributed? And when you have a situation, one of the richest countries that has ever existed where people live in circumstances where they are, their lives are all too often defined by insecurity and by hardship, the inability to realise their full potential. Now, that is an indictment of the way our society is run. Now, the reason I say it's interesting talking about the attitudes of the 19th century, because, of course, in the 1830s, you had the Great Reform Bill. And what that did is enfranchise a fifth of the population. Uh, so it enabled certain, uh, again, relatively privileged sections of society, but far, a far bigger franchise than existed before. But it was regarded as a great betrayal that people who had struggled and everything we have in this country, all our rights and freedoms were won, of course, by our ancestors. So you had the likes, you know, in 1819 of Peterloo, the massacre there when women and men and children gathered to demand change and they were massacred, uh, some of them, of course, by, by, the, uh, by the forces of the state. Um, and what you had at the same time in the 1830s, alongside the uh, Reform Bill, and the reason it was such a great betrayal, were the poor laws and the changes in the nature of the poor laws. And what that basically meant was relief for those in poverty so long as they worked in what became, of course, uh, the poor houses. Uh, and these were terrible conditions, terrible, uh, a terrible situation for people. And unless they worked there... Uh, in, in the most awful, unbearable conditions, then they would be deprived of any relief whatsoever. And what's fascinating is the rhetoric of that time often echoes the rhetoric we hear today, often uh, disturbingly so. Karl Marx, of course, said that uh, the first time history repeats itself, it's a tragedy, the second time it's a farce. Well, I think we live, unfortunately, all too often in an era of farce. And you'll get, there was this preacher at the time who said that the respectable working class of London had abandoned their post and given it to and surrendered to the residuum, as they were known. Residuum was the word, uh, a word, I suppose, the most relevant word we use today would be the underclass. And the point about the residuum is they were defined by their behaviour, that they were in those conditions, not because of the way society was structured, because of their own behavioural defects, their immorality, if you like. And, uh, you know, you had these uh, Christian preachers at the time, so-called. Uh, there was obviously another Christian tradition which opposed it. But they were almost, you'd read them, and it kind of has echoes of columns in the Daily Mail writing about social security uh, today. I mean, there was one who said uh, that, you know, uh, one part of the unemployed were lazy, another part uh, were, were so uh, beyond help they should be exterminated. 
and then there was a third uh, who might be, uh, uh, you know, could be salvaged in some way. And of course, famously, we have that distinction between the deserving poor and the undeserving poor. Now, in the aftermath of 1945 in particular, there was a recognition that poverty was a social problem. And by that, what we mean is a collective failing. It was the, to do with the way society was organised. It wasn't something you could reduce to people's individual personality defects. So because it was seen as a collective problem, the obvious answer was you need collective solutions. That only by us collectively organising together and using the power of the state could these collective failings be remedied. And of course, that was the whole basis uh, for the welfare state. Now, what we had from the late 70s onwards was a backlash to that, a counter-revolution, where what were once seen as social problems like poverty and unemployment again became, above all else, defined by people's individual behaviour. That if you were poor or unemployed, then you yourself had to take personal responsibility for that. So as unemployment uh, massively increased, of course, in the early 80s, as Britain experienced the most rapid form of deindustrialization at that time that any peacetime developed country had experienced in such a short space of time. Norman Tebbit, famously, uh, of course, the right-hand man, or one of them, of Margaret Thatcher, he took to the podium of Conservative Party conference and said, in the 1930s during the Great Depression, when his dad was out of work, then he got on his bike and he went out and looked for it. He didn't riot. And get on your bike almost became a national slogan. That if you were unemployed, that was your own responsibility. If you failed to get a job, then you yourself had to take personal blame. It wasn't a failure of government policy. And it was the same, of course, with poverty overall. This sense of people, uh, if they were in these conditions, then they, it was a sense, if you like, of, of a personal defect. And this was very convenient because inequality, as you will all know, exploded during the 1980s. Now, inequality is an irrational thing. That some people are born in families with huge comfort, the odds stacked in their favour from day one, whilst other people are born into families where odds are stacked against them and experience a much shorter, uh, you know, uh, stand, uh, or a, a, sorry, much uh, less comfortable standard of living. Where you grow up in Carlton in Glasgow and you have a life expectancy as a man of 53 years, the same as the, as the Gaza Strip, or less than the Gaza Strip whilst in the richest parts of London you can expect to live three decades longer, above all else because of the family in which you were born. So a convenient way of justifying inequality was to say actually that inequality was a reflection of people's contribution and effort. That if you were rich and you were at the top of society, that's because you work hard, you're intelligent, more intelligent than the rest, you're cleverer than the rest. If you're at the bottom of society, again, that is your responsibility, you failed. You, you're work shy, you're lazy, you're feckless, you're simply not good enough. And that kind of the individualization of you know, what was seen before as collective failings is absolutely essential to understand what happened. So the welfare state, if you believe that poverty is a, so, is a, a personal failing, then what justification for a welfare state? All it is doing is subsidizing people's own failings. That if they need to take responsibility, that means rolling back the state. So that's been used, of course, to justify it. And you see cultural echoes of it, of course. We've seen uh, the rise in the last few years of so-called poverty porn. And what poverty porn is all about is hunting down often the most extreme and unrepresentative examples. You know, in the medieval period, they put people in the stocks and threw vegetables at them. Now we put them on Channel 4, uh, on Channel 4 in various documentaries. Uh, and, and what happened, the whole point of this is to show, above all else, Again, that these are personal failings. These are personal uh, defects that the individual uh, has to themselves uh, resolve. The media, the press, will hunt down the most extreme and unrepresentative examples of people living in mansions made out of widescreen television sets. Always widescreen television sets. You can't actually buy any other <coughs> form of television anymore, but we'll park that for now. Um, and, and people with 50 kids and, and all the rest. And that is supposed to encourage the idea that here it, or this, these aren't exceptions. This is the tip of the iceberg. Now, the reality in modern Britain is most people in poverty are in work. And these are people who get up in the morning and they earn their poverty day after day. Where we've had, in the last few years, hundreds of thousands of workers, disproportionately women, have been driven into poverty pay. And over the next few years, 
those at the bottom of society, again, people in work, their income is projected to fall because of cuts to, uh, whether it be uh, cuts to benefits and changes to tax, to take into account, for example, the increase in VAT. So at the same time, we've had uh, the wealth of the richest 1,000 people has more than doubled uh, during a period of, of course, one of our greatest economic crises uh, since the 1930s. This is a society where the very, one of the most basic rights of all, or the most basic need other than breathing and drinking water to eat, is denied of people in what is, of course, the sixth now richest economy um, on the face of the earth. That hundreds of thousands of people in Britain in 2016 marched to food banks, to charities, in order to satisfy that one of the most basic human needs of all, eating. 300,000 of them kids. The Red Cross, for the first time since World War II, organising emergency food aid for communities. Now, in 1945, after the vanquishing of Nazi tyranny, there was a sense of optimism that there would be constant social progress, that people's problems would have these collective solutions. What horror would they think if they knew in 2016 people would be driven to, fit to charities in order to eat? I think that would have been beyond many people's comprehension. That this is a society where hundreds of, well, millions of families now are languishing on, on, on social housing waiting lists, deprived again of one of the most basic rights of all, to have a decent, affordable home for them and for their families. Where, you know, I'm in London, I'm a plastic northern, I've sold out my northern roots, but I live in London, and London is a great city, a booming, wealthy city, where new built properties are snapped up by oligarchs from Russia and the like and left empty. You can cycle past them as I do and the windows are all dark because nobody lives there. Whilst at the same time, one in four children in that booming, wealthy metropolitan city grow up in an overcrowded home. And we know the damage of overcrowding to children in terms of insecurity, in terms of to, to mental health, to educational attainment, physical health, far more likely to have, for example, asthma as a consequence. It damages not just their potential, but of course, all of us as a society, because that potential um, isn't unlocked. At the same time, because people look, how can this possibly happen? And there are many reasons for it. One is the fact that wages have fallen for the longest period now, since the 19th century, since Queen Victoria sat on the throne, that of the advanced industrialized countries, the so-called OECD countries, no country other than Greece, which matches us, has had such a fall in wages over the last uh, few years. So a sudden decrease in wages. At the same time of in-work benefits being cut, of people's access for them taken away. So we'll talk, of course, about the establishment in the financial sector shortly. But needless to say, for example, give me an example. A 60-year-old man called Stephen Taylor. Now, this six-year-old man is a former soldier a former serviceman, and he's 60 years old, he's out of work. And if you're out of work at the age of 60, as some of you will know, it's so hard to get work. But he was trying his best. And what he did as he was searching for work is he, he sold poppies for the Royal Legion to raise money for maimed and injured former comrades of his. And he was selling these poppies in a supermarket where he applied for work but was unsuccessful. He had his benefits stopped for four weeks, sanctioned, on the basis that his volunteering for the Royal Legion showed he wasn't trying hard enough to look for work. And that is a situation that hundreds of thousands of people have found themselves in. Their benefits are sanctioned, so they have no money. Now, I met a group of young working-class women in South, wrap up in Southampton, and they'd had their benefits sanctioned. And what some of them did is they went to food banks, but you can only get referred three times, and that's it. Or they went to legal loan sharks. Yeah, but he's your Cobbett man. I'm not your Cobbett man. Uh, uh, the whole point is he talks about Cobbett. I'm relating it to today's time. The legal loan sharks where uh, they can't afford to pay back those loans. So that they only went to other legal loan sharks in order to pay off. Now, the reason to link it back to his time, this was the time of debtors' prisons, where people were imprisoned by their personal debt. And so history repeats itself. And that's the tragedy. The 19th century was a time of these grave injustices that we were supposed to have wiped out in the 20th century, and they re-emerge again, monstrously so, in the 21st. Thank you very much.